What's up guys, in this video we're going to do a vanilla tutorial, you know me, I like to do a good balance of both add-ons and vanilla stuff just to kind of um, appease the whole community. So yeah, we're just going to kind of hop into it and um, let me turn off my add-ons as a matter of fact because I might unknowingly <laughs> try to use it. So yeah, uh, add-ons are great, but if you're new, it's like trying to learn calculus without knowing algebra. You need to know the fundamentals, so that's why I do videos like this. So basically, you, you've seen from the thumbnail what we're going to make, so we're going to go to mesh and then cube, and the first thing we want to do is convert this cube into a sphere. Now there are sphere options, as you may know, but the best way to get a perfect sphere is by using a cube and subdividing it into a sphere. So what we're going to do for that is press control 3, maybe control 4, Control 5, let's do Control 5 to add 5 counts. Apply that, then we'll apply a cast modifier. We're going to change the cast type to a sphere. Put this up to 1, not 10, 1. And now what we're going to have is a perfect sphere, and we can go ahead and right click and shade that smooth. So I want to start slicing this guy up and getting the piece that you saw in the thumbnail. So if you're a beginner, then what you need to do is go up here to Edit and then Preferences, and you're going to turn on the Bull tool add-on here. It's free, comes with the blender, just type it in, enter bool, and like, you know, like you're chilling on the couch, and then um, turn that guy on. What we're going to do is hop to the top view, and what I want to do is add in a cube here. What we're going to do, once we add in that cube, is pull it down a bit on the y-axis, and then I'm just going to basically chop out this front half. So we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, shift-click on this, press control minus on the numpad, and now what we have is the ability to kind of move this thing back and forth if we select this cube here. We can kind of move it back and forth to get all sorts of different effects here. You're going to notice that as we move it, we get these weird shading errors going on. See that? As we kind of move it, we get um, just shading issues in general. And uh, that's simply because if I were to, which we're going to do in a second, maybe put it here and go to this guy. So um, I kind of want to you know, focus this on beginners as well. So. To hide this guy, you press the H key, and now what we have is a cut, that's what we just made. Issue here is if we tab into edit mode, what do we have? We still have the sphere, and a lot of people ask me this, what gives? This is intended functionality, so whenever you add in a boolean and you don't apply the modifier over here, you can see there's an option to apply it, that means it's still live in the stack, meaning the change is shown in object mode, but in terms of the physical geometry that exists, it is not actually applied. This is the real mesh, this is just a preview of what it would look like um, when we apply that boolean. So if we want to have access to this geometry, what we have to do is come in here and click apply. And now we're actually going to have access to that geometry as you can see. And you're going to see we have a lot of geometry in here. I mean we probably could have gotten away with less, but um, yeah, it, it is what it is really. It's probably a good enough amount. So next thing I want to do right off the bat is apply a bevel modifier. And once again, you know, if you're familiar with my channel and have watched my videos, you know what bevel does. Basically, bevel is going to give a nice rounded edge to this piece. So um, right now, the limit method is set to none. We want to change it over to angle so that way every single edge doesn't get beveled. It only bevels based off of the angles of the edges. So we're going to go to angle and now we're going to only have this side beveled here. Okay, so now as you can see we have a, um, a small little bevel. Let's first of all go in here, go to normals, and then turn on auto smooth. That'll help clean up the shading a bit. And you're going to see now we only have a bevel here. Issue is if we go in here and try to adjust the offset, you're going to see it only bevels a little bit. And this is intended functionality. So if I were to go in here and go into um, viewport display and go to wireframe, you're going to see kind of how the bevel's working if I turn this up. You're going to see we have a small bevel, but it'll stop beveling once it starts overlapping with edges. Like right here, it's going to start overlapping. See this? We have a bevel coming, and then as we push it out, right there is when it would start overlapping. So that's why the bevel stops going. But if you want to keep going and overlap and just kind of override that, all we have to do is turn off the clamp overlap option, and now we can go as high as we want as you can see. And the way I use clamp overlap is more so for a um, 
I guess diagnosing issues purpose more so than actually using it for what it's intended for. Yeah, I always turn off clamp, but it's really good for quickly diagnosing issues and seeing if you have overlaps. So, for example, if you have a bevel and you turn on clamp overlap and it gets smaller, that basically indicates to you, hey, I have overlaps going on. I need to go in there and fix that. We'll discuss more about that in a second. So what I want to do is turn the segment count up to about three. You can go higher if you want, three, five, ten. I just, three is enough for me. If you go too high, you know, the more segments you go, the more geometry you get, but three is probably just fine for the human eye. And I'm actually going to go outside of wireframe view here. And you're going to see what we have is a nice bevel, but really, really um, shaded strange. And this is actually intended functionality. We'll kind of explain what's going on for beginners out there and even people experienced that don't really know the back end reasoning. So every single point on your mesh, every single vertex has an orientation to it. Um, if you've taken a calculus course before, you're probably familiar with the concept of a tangent. And I'll just pull, I put up a picture just to make it easier. So this is, whoops, let me get this one. This picture right here, this is a tangent. It hits a curve like this at exactly one point, but doesn't intersect the curve. That's how a tangent's working. Now a normal is completely perpendicular to the tangent. So the normal, um, I'll just type in normal and tangent so you can see. I kind of like to explain back end stuff right here. Good example. So this right here is a normal and it hits the tangent perpendicular. And we call this the same thing in 3D. We call these, um, these points normals. So with that in mind, if we were to go in here and turn on normals for vertices, you're gonna see that every single little edge coming out of these vertices is completely perpendicular to that vertex, like I just showed in the picture. So that's what a normal is. Now there's actually an issue when it comes to normals. Sometimes when you start going over a curved surface, the normals can be incorrectly oriented causing bad shading. So the best way to fix that and reorient the normals to make them completely perpendicular is to either one, turn on the hardened normals option, or two, turn on a weighted normal. Now these are both one and the same. The only difference is the hardened normals option is built into the bevel modifier, whereas the weighted normal is a separate modifier. Only difference is hardened normals applies a sharp, weighted normals doesn't if you don't know what that is. Don't worry about it. Basically, all you need to do to reorient the normals over bevels to make it shade properly is tick on the harder normals option. So we're gonna do that. And you're gonna see already it starts looking a lot better minus these weird shading issues here, which we'll take care of. So what we just fixed is the shading problems. Now shading is completely different from artifacting. Shading, like I just explained, has to do with how the normals are calculated. And by ticking on the harder normals option, we fix that. The real issue here comes with these really dark spots, these artifacts going on. And this is not on a rendering level, this is on a physical level. What's happening is the geometry is overlapping and causing these distortions. This has nothing to do with shading and everything to do with how the geometry is being positioned. So take a look, if I apply this bevel modifier, you're gonna see some of these points are overlapping. It might be easier to see if I do this in wireframe instead. So turn this on, check this out. We kind of mentioned it before, but as I start pushing out the bevel more, eventually, look right here, it starts overlapping. See that? And that's precisely what's happening. So the way you fix this is to, one, prevent overlaps, or two, drop the bevel to be smaller so overlaps don't occur. Sometimes that's easier said than done. The easiest way to fix this is to do a little combination of a smaller bevel as well as just fixing it manually. So I'm going to drop the bevel a bit more just because when I do bevels I like more of a machine look to it and in general machine type of objects don't have a really massive bevel, they're usually quite tiny. So just a small bevel is enough to kind of capture the reflections on the edge, it looks better. So yeah, do that and now all we have to do is take care of the overlaps which is really easy. We just go in here, let me also turn off this um, normal stuff, I don't like it. Turn that off. So all we have to do is simply select a vertex and double tap the G key to slide this out of the way. Now these aren't overlapping anymore. This one is going to have uh, be an issue simply because these vertices are too close to each other. And that's also going to cause an overlap. So what we can do is go up here, turn on this auto merge option, and simply merge these together. We'll just double tap the G key and then slide this one in. 
and now that's taken care of as you can see. And basically you do the same thing all around. So for this one, same idea. All you do is you come in here, slide these guys out of the way so they're not overlapping, slide these together. Really, really easy stuff. And yeah, basically you're gonna do the same exact thing all the way around this piece. I'm not gonna bother doing that on video because literally all I'm doing is coming in here and just sliding these guys out of the way. So yeah, all you need to do is find the bad spots with the shading artifacts and do the same thing we've been doing. All right, so I just went ahead and fixed everything up. Now what you may have done is went all the way around the circle and cleaned everything up manually. So you might call me an asshole for this, but I wanted you to feel that annoyance of having to do that so you can understand that you need to take shortcuts when it's possible. Let me show you something really cool. So obviously you would have had to go all the way around and do this manually, it sucks. Instead what you can do if you're working with a symmetrical object like this is you can simply deal with the first half and then symmetrize to the other side and just basically knock out half the work. So what we're going to do is simply go into the front view, you're going to press 1 on the numpad and then 5 on the numpad to go into orthographic view so that way you have a completely perfect view of the front. And now what we're going to do is tab into edit mode, you can go into any of the modes here. And what we're going to do is go up here to mesh and then symmetrize. And in this case we want to symmetrize over the X axis. So now there's two different axis options, one is negative to positive, one's positive to negative. So you want to make sure you're symmetrizing from the good side to the bad side, not the other way around. So in this case I want to symmetrize from uh, this side over to here. So let's try positive x to negative x and see how that works, and there we go. Now as you can see, we actually have the correct side being symmetrized, and we just eliminated basically half the work. Um, actually, it looks like I forgot this bottom area, so let me just take care of that. And then same idea, you can hop in here, select everything, and then go to mesh, and then symmetrize again, and it's just the easiest thing. And now we have a completely symmetrical and perfectly shaded mesh here. All right, so next what we're gonna do is get into some more detail on this thing. So we're gonna do something called the slice operation. So what I'm gonna do is hop into the front view, once again, one on the numpad, and I wanna take this guy and do a slice in the middle. You'll see what a slice is in a second. So I'm just gonna add in a new cylinder here. Let's make it like um, 32, not, not 32, 64 vertices. If that hawk outside will be quiet or whatever that bird is. Uh, 64 vertices, we're going to right click and shade it smooth and then go to auto smooth so that way um, basically smoothing it out gives you okay shading but if you want to even out the edges so it doesn't smooth over the edges as well you have to turn on auto smooth so we're going to do that in addition and now we have a nice cylinder here and then what we're going to do is rotate this guy 90 degrees over the X axis so R, X and then 90 and then if we just scale this guy down we're going to put it right on the inside here around here should be okay and we'll grab it on the y-axis as well and what I want to do on this guy is shift click on the sphere and we're gonna press control forward slash on the numpad to get a slice now make sure you're doing it on the numpad not on the keyboard people ask me this all the time the numpad is not the keyboard it's the thing on the right of your keyboard so make sure you do that control forward slash and now what we're gonna have is basically two separate objects with a slice right here on this ridge. So all that really did was it separated these two objects based off of where the cylinder is positioned. So that's all that's happening. So yeah, pretty cool. What we're going to do is actually hide this guy with the H key and just go in here and apply the booleans on both of these guys. Now sometimes when you run slice operations, it shares the data, which um, it, it's separate objects, but it's sharing the same data. And then what happens is it doesn't allow you to apply the modifiers don't worry about why this happened. just go in here to this triangle panel tick on this number and then you'll be able to actually apply your boolean and here you're gonna apply the boolean as well don't apply the bevel because we want to have full control over that bevel and if we apply it then we can't really change the bevel as you can see and as you can see once we apply that boolean it also picked up our bevel as well which is nice so what we're gonna do is um, let's see tab into face mode I want to select this face as a matter of fact, let's select these two faces and press the F key to fill that into an end gone. There's no need to have that edge in the middle. And we're going to press Control B to run a bevel. 
and I'm just going to do a single segment bevel, so scroll down until you only have one. And we're basically just going to pull this guy into about here, and now we have this thing. And this is actually one of my favorite things to do with models like this. I love adding in slices and then adding in a manual bevel afterwards because it gives you this nice cool effect here. So yeah, looking pretty good so far. No bad shading errors or anything, so um, making good progress. Next, what I want to do is run some array of circles around the edge of this uh, sphere here. So I'm going to go into the front view and we're going to add in another cylinder. So shift A, add a cylinder. We'll go ahead and shade this smooth and turn on auto smooth and let's rotate this guy 90 degrees over the x-axis again. So doing a radial array, basically arraying around in a circular pattern, is not that easy in vanilla. Well actually I shouldn't say not that easy. It's not that beginner friendly I guess. So I'm going to show you step by step what you do. So first thing I want to do is move this guy up just onto the top here. This is roughly where I want to start the radial array. Scale it down a bit and then let's go ahead and just move it out like that. Okay, pretty good. Maybe a bit more. Okay, and now what we're going to do is simply add on an array modifier and you're going to see what this does is it makes the piece array in one direction. You know, you can make this the X, you can make it the Y. Um, if I can type this in right. You can make it the y-axis or z-axis. Uh, in this case, this is the y-axis, but it's going on the z because the rotation here is not applied. But if I were to apply the rotation with control A and lock that in, it'll actually be on the right axis now. But yeah, basically this gives you control over whatever axis you want to array this on. Now, I don't want to array it on an axis. I want to array it around a circle. So to do that, I'm going to go into the front view and we're going to add in an empty object. And this just basically gives us a pivot point. There's no reason I'm using an empty. You could use any object you want. Nice thing about empties is they don't add any extra stress to your scene. So I'm going to press shift A and add in an empty plane axis like that. And what we're going to do is allow the array to go around as we rotate this piece. So what we need to do is a few different things. First of all, we need to take this guy and make the object offset based off of this um, empty here. So tick off relative offset, turn on object offset, and pick this empty right here. Next, we need to press Control A to apply the scale on the cylinder because um, if the scale isn't applied, like right now it's 0 0.052, it's basically multiplying that 20 times the size because 0 0.05 is, you know, roughly. Uh, 20% of the even values of 1 like we should have, right? So basically this is 20 times bigger. So yeah, make sure you press Control A and apply the scale. And for good measure you could do it on this as well if you scaled up the empty, but I didn't so I'm going to leave it alone. And now you're going to see if I were to move this around, it kind of, you know, moves this arrayed cylinder with it. Now that's not what I'm going for. I want this piece to go around in a circle. So we need to select the cylinder here, right click and then set the origin to the 3D cursor which is in the center of the grid as you can see. So now what we're doing is um, basically allowing this pivot to go around the middle. So now if I rotate this around the Y, see what's happening? Now it's rotating off of this pivot point right here. So what I'm going to do is rotate, you know, well it kind of depends on how many pieces you want. Let's say I added in like 10 pieces. So um, if I wanted 10 of these guys going around and we're going 360 degrees, then we need to do 36 degree increments, 360 divided by uh, 10. So I want 10 of these, so I'm going to select the cylinder and make the count 10. Take this empty and then rotate it 36 degrees. And now we have a completely even set of points around here. And now all I want to do is take this guy and then shift click on the sphere and press control minus to add in a difference. You're going to see these are kind of weirdly shaded. We need to make sure we also shade smooth the cutter. So select the cutters, shade it smooth, turn on auto smooth and make sure that this piece is shaded smooth as well. And if that's not working, I already know what the problem is. You need to make sure your booleans are above the bevel because what's happening right now is it's first applying the bevel and then running the boolean operation. I want to run the boolean operation and then have the bevel pick up on those cuts as well. And yeah, just like that, it's um, a little bit tedious like you saw, but you'll get used to it the more you work with it. 
And now we have a pretty cool looking piece here. I'm happy with that. And I'm going to show you one more cool trick that I love to use. So if we take this, um, take the cylinders back. So uh, in this case, whenever you run a Boolean difference, it actually makes like a bounding box around the cutters. Uh, in reality, this is just a cylinder, but it takes the bounding box of all the pieces whenever you use the Boolean difference. Um, I don't mind it, so I'm going to leave it alone, but if you don't like that it does that, you can actually go in here, go to viewport display and change this to like a solid, which would basically show the array, or maybe like a wire or bounds. I like the bounds effect though, because I like seeing um, how big the Boolean is. So let me show you this cool little trick that a lot of people don't know about. If you've seen my reverse bevels tutorial, you know what I'm about to do. Uh, first thing I want to do is scale this guy a bit in edit mode. If we were to scale this in object mode, it's going to scale everything in a weird direction. So if we scale this in edit mode, it'll actually affect all the arrayed pieces as well. So we're just going to scale that a bit in edit mode, make it smaller. And then I want to go into face mode, take this face, and then grab it on the Y axis. So G, Y, and then pull it back a bit right to about here. And now what I'm going to do is bevel this piece. I kind of want to have like a nice chamfer going outwards uh, like we have on this piece. So if I press Control B and apply a bevel right now, you're going to see the bevel is going inwards instead of outwards. That's not what I want. So if we want the bevel to go outwards instead, we need to flip the normal direction. Remember we discussed normals before. If we flip the direction of the normal, then it will bevel in the opposite direction. So because it's going to push in the opposite direction that the bevel would normally go, right? So to do that, we're going to go up here to Mesh, Normals, and then Flip the Normals. You can also press the Alt N key and do it here if you want to have an easier to access menu. And now if we press Control B, it's going to bevel outwards like this. Very, very neat. So we'll just bevel that and then hide this piece. And let's also drop the segment, or not the segment count, the offset amount a little bit. So that way it's kind of more like, um, like a machine look to it, like that. Maybe a bit more so it doesn't look too bad, like that. So really all this did was it gave it a bit more oomph to it, just made it look more, uh, I don't know, detailed. And sometimes the small changes are what make the most detail in your models. So yeah, when you can do stuff like this, I'm a fan of it. And yeah, what we're going to do now is just keep adding a few more pieces of detail. You know, I don't want this tutorial to be way too long. I just want to make sure I'm covering um, all the important stuff and then, you know, allow you to make your own. So next thing I'm going to do is go into the front view and I want to add in a cube here. So we're going to go to mesh and then cube and scale down the cube, pull it up to about here. And I'm also going to pull this out on the Y axis a bit like that. And what I want to do is shift click on this piece in the middle, press control forward slash on the numpad and run another slice operation. So now what I can do is tab into uh, edge mode. Let's do it for the cutter only. So select the cutter, tab into edge mode. Now check this out. See how the cutter um, is what's controlling that slice? Likewise, we can make cool designs to the cutter as well to make the slice look cool. So what I'm going to do is take these two edges here, shift click both of them. We'll press control B and run, let's run a champ for just one segment and maybe pull this down a bit like that. And now we kind of have this detail. And all I want to do from this point on is hide it. We're going to go ahead and apply the Boolean. So like I said, if you can't apply it, you have to go in here and turn on the this button. And this only does it when you're using the slice operation because it's sharing data. So just make sure you click on that number. We're going to, um, first of all, apply the Boolean. And I just do want to mention one thing. Notice how when we apply the Boolean, the bevel kicks in. This is basically doing the same thing if we put the Boolean above the bevel. What happens is it always calculates the top of the stack first and then works its way down. And booleans and bevels are not interchangeable pieces. So the moment I apply the boolean, it's um it's treating it as if this boolean was already on the top. So that's basically what's what's kind of happening. Anyways, we have some issues here. We'll take care of that in a second. For this one, let's do the same thing. Apply the boolean. There we go. And there's one thing I want to point out that I absolutely hate. I wish it was not a default in Blender, but it is. So if we go into, you might be able to see it here, but if we go into wireframe, you're going to see we have these really weird like pinching effects, like a triangle going into the corners. This is called the miter type. I hate these because it looks too pinched to me. What I like to do is go in here to the bevel modifier, 
change the outer miter type to an arc so that way it's a lot smoother like that. And um, if any developer happens to watch this video, I would love if the arc was the default one, but anyways, you can't get everything you want in life, so what we're going to do is turn off wireframe and go to this one as well, change this to an arc just because, didn't really make a difference, but whatever. And then just like we did at the beginning of the video, we have to clean up these shading artifacts here. So we're just going to tab into vertex mode and just take a look. Now if this is too awkward to look at, you can press the forward slash button on the numpad to isolate it. Also press 5 on the numpad to get into perspective. And as you can see, here's the issue. And also if you try to zoom in and you get this weird clipping going on, go to this view panel, press the N key, go to view, and drop the clip start to like 0 0.01 instead. And now you can kind of zoom in. Anyways, you can see the issue here. This one needs to be merged down, so double tap the G key slide that and then maybe slide this one as well just for good measure okay same idea for this piece slide this one slide that one and that was a really easy fix so forward slash on the numpad again to go back into global view so same idea for this piece right here we'll select it and um, get to work so by um, default intuition you might think okay let me slide this one in and in this case we actually got lucky it worked but if this slid any closer, we probably, probably would have gotten like a um, shading artifact right there. This is not a good move. So for this one, I would only move this one down. Or what you probably could have done is selected this edge in edge mode, press the X key, and then went to dissolve edges, and that would have probably done the same thing in terms of shading. So either way works. I'm just going to keep it consistent, slide this one down, and there we go. So same thing to the other side, we're going to take this vertex and double tap the G key to slide it down, and there we go. So we'll go outside of local view, and now we have a pretty cool little indentation or notch, whatever you want to call this, in the top. And to make it even cooler, I'm going to tab into edge mode and control click across to these edges here. We'll press control B. Actually, let's just do it for the bottom ones here, control B on this one, run a very small notch there pretty cool and I'm also gonna drop the offset a bit to give it more of a machine look to it so right about there and this one 0 0.003 as well not too bad and then what I like to do is something I like to call stealing geometry some of you may have seen this trick before what I'm gonna do is tab into the or not tab into just press 1 on the numpad to go into front view go into edge mode and I'm gonna control click um, all the way around and just select this set of edges here. Now I want to duplicate them. So Shift D to duplicate, right click to cancel, and then P to separate by selection. So now we have a separate piece here, which we basically stole from this guy. So whenever you steal geometry, it shares the same modifiers as the geometry you stole from. So in this case, we have a bevel on it. For now, let's turn that off. What I'm going to do is now to scale this in a bit, can't really see where it's scaling into. So if we press the Z key, we can go into wireframe. I'm just going to scale this in some more like that. We'll move it outside to the front. And now let's simply go into um, vertex mode, select everything with the A key. Now I just want to extrude these, so E to extrude, and then Alt S to scale along those normals, so like this. Like that, and then we'll go and um, just select everything with the A key. As a matter of fact, this is not flat right now, so let's select it with the A key. Scale it on the Y axis, so S, Y, and then 0 to flatten it. And now if we press the E key, we can simply extrude into the mesh here like that. Pretty cool. And now all I want to do is shade this smooth and then turn on Auto Smooth, which it should be on. And we're just going to shift click on this guy and run a difference boolean like that. And of course, um, we might need to reposition the boolean so make sure the boolean is above the bevel here and now we're gonna have a pretty nice result and we can also maybe move this back just a bit like that pretty cool I'm just gonna hide this guy and then the last thing I want to do before we um this thing looks boring I know but I'm gonna show you the power of rendering and getting nice composition this thing can look really cool if you actually set it up properly so what we're gonna do now is add in a cylinder Let's rotate the cylinder 90 degrees over the x-axis, so Rx and then 90. Right click to shade smooth and then turn on auto smooth. What we're going to do is scale this guy down, bring it out a bit, 
and then simply run a difference boolean here with control and minus on the numpad. And of course, make sure your boolean is above the bevel, like that. And all I wanna do now is that reverse bevel trick. We'll go into face mode, move this face back a bit, Alt N to flip the normals, and then Control B to run a bevel like that. And there we go. So I just taught you most of the modeling tricks and the fundamentals you need to know to actually get started on your own, or maybe just to build up more of your wealth of information and just kind of know what's happening. So this here, we discussed topology management, how booleans work, how to set up bevels, modifier stack, all that good stuff. That is literally the gist of hard surface modeling. Now this is a very, very basic piece. Um, as you get more experience, you could probably recreate this in five minutes, especially if you're using add-ons. But uh, this is you know, simple enough for a beginner's tutorial, and I think everyone can uh, probably make something like this uh, after having modeled this piece. So now what we're gonna do is actually make this thing as exciting because modeling's half the battle, right? You can have the best model, but if you don't render it or make it look good, it was all for nothing. So we're gonna go and make this thing look really cool. So when we're rendering, we wanna always pay attention to the angles and how the lighting's hitting the object. Very important stuff. So before we actually render, we need to add some materials to it. So what I'm gonna do is go up here to the material view, and right now the just the default material is a white material. Let me also hide this empty with the H key. So I wanna give this guy a metallic material to it. So we're gonna to go to the materials menu here and click on new, and just put the metallic value all the way up to one, so now this is a metal. And then what we can do is go to base color and drop that a bit, and then maybe drop the roughness a bit as well, like that. Let's actually make this a bit brighter and put the roughness to about here. And you can also give these objects a bit of clear coat. You don't have to, but sometimes it makes it look cool. So just a bit of clear coat to kind of pick up those reflections on the side. Now your, um, your viewport, well, we'll discuss it in a second. Let's just hold off on that. Anyways, let's go to the next one here, this middle piece, and let's add in the same material from the drop down. And what we can do is click on this number next to it to make it a separate material and then maybe make this one a bit darker or something to make it have some variation. And this one will give the original material as well, like that. So this is the gist of things. If you want a metallic material, you put the metallic slider up to one. If you want a dielectric material, put it to zero. You can adjust the roughness as well to make it reflective or rough. And you can always adjust the color as well. That's basically all you need to know about materials and how they work. The next and most important part is setting up this thing for rendering. So I'm gonna go into the front view here, and we always wanna set up our render in general with a base plane to let it sit on. So I'm gonna press Shift A and then add in a plane. Let's put this right on the bottom. Make sure there's a small enough gap to get the shadows as well, so right about here. We'll scale this guy up, make it really big. Like that. We can go in here and add in a new material and make this one metallic maybe with some uh, lower roughness to kind of capture the reflection some more. And now what we want to do is go into the rendering view. So I'm gonna go up here to the rendering panel and just give it a second to load. And what you're gonna have is a much more accurate representation um, with the Cycles rendering engine. Now, um, for the floor, I'm gonna make this base color a bit darker. And I do wanna mention, your rendering view is gonna look way worse than this. You're probably gonna have something like this. Reason being is because I'm using an HDRI for the lighting. I'll link the HDRI I use in the description. It's free to download. Basically, you're gonna download that, go to this color input panel under the world tab, go to environment texture, and then simply open that HDRI file that's in the description, just download it. And we'll just um, open that up. And now what you're gonna have is a much nicer uh, calculation of light because this is actually using a real world photo for natural light. Whereas before all we had was just a completely dark and neutral background. So that's why you wanna go with HDRIs that come from the real world like this. And basically you have a pretty cool object here. Now what we need to do is add in a backdrop to actually uh, make this thing have something in the background. We also wanna consider where the lighting's hitting this thing from. In this case, the lighting's hitting it from the uh, rear side, which you know, you may or not, may not want. Uh, what I actually want is for the lighting to kind of hit it from the front. 
So I'm going to go up here, uh, drag up a new panel. We're going to go to the shader editor and go to the world tab. Now you're probably going to have these three right here. If you don't have these two, simply go to edit preferences and turn on the node wrangler add-on. Just enable that guy. And then all you have to do is select this and press control T on the keyboard to get that. And um, hang on a second. Yeah, then basically you just connect these up and, or they should be connected up. And then what you can do is rotate this HDRI until you get it where you want. So you'll see as I rotate this more, the HDRI starts moving. So I can basically move this so the lighting hits it more from the front. So if we take a look, you can see this is like 45 degrees, for example. This is like 60. You get the idea. I'm going to do like, I don't know, 75 degrees or so. That should be OK. Maybe 85 or something. 90. I'm just trying to find a good position for it. And also, this uh, lighting orientation is also dependent on where you're viewing it from in the camera. If we look at the side, right? you know, compared to in this angle, you might have a different uh, view of the light. So this is where the composition kind of comes into play. You have to figure out where you want this render to be from. This, in my opinion, is a good enough render right here. So what we're going to do is set up a backdrop and then render this guy. So to add a backdrop, I'm just going to go in here to the top view, add in a single plane, rotate the plane 90 degrees over the x-axis, and then rotate it like that and then just kind of scale it up and pull it back. Really easy stuff. So I want it to be right around here. Actually, wrong side. Let me make sure it's on the other side. So over here somewhere. Okay. And all we're gonna do is just basically rotate this guy and scale it until it's how we want it to look. Something like this should be okay. And for the backdrops, getting backdrops and floor reflectivity is tricky because everything you change adjusts the effect of the light. For example, on the floor, if I made the floor really dark, you're going to see the bottom of the cylinder is going to be dark. Or not the cylinder, but the sphere here. You're going to see if it's really bright, the bottom gets to be really illuminated. So you have to find a good balance of um, what type of color you want and how much that light is going to reflect onto the object. So I'm going for more of a darker color here, and then maybe for the backdrop we can do a new one. You can make the backdrop metallic if you want. I would suggest experimenting. In general, I leave them as dielectric and increase the roughness and then maybe drop the base color a bit. And really just play with it so something like this would be okay. And then maybe for the floor I'll give it a bit more clear coat just because clear coat looks nice and then maybe a bit less roughness as well like that. And at this point, all we need to do is set up our camera for rendering. So we're going to press Shift A, add in a camera. We're going to go to View, and then Align View, Align Active Camera to View. And now we're going to have this. So this is the hard part, getting a good angle for the camera. All you have to really do is move this thing around until you find a good position. Now in general, something like 135 millimeters will give a more orthographic view of this. So I'm going to do that and then rotate or move it back a little bit like that, maybe a bit more like that. Really, it's all just experimentation, figuring out what you like and what looks good in the scene. In this case, this is good. Just make sure you give the side some breathing room as well. You don't want it to be all congested in the camera. And also, we can go to this output panel and turn on the render region option so that way it's only showing what the render is going to look like. So maybe move this. Sometimes you could also even reposition the floor, kind of make your objects float in the air, make it look more light. Um, really do whatever you want. I also want to tab into vertex mode and bevel this vertex. Right now, this point is way too sharp. So if we take this vertex, we can press Control, Shift, and B and run a bevel like this and just make it a bit more flat like that. And yeah, we have a pretty good view now, and we're just about ready to render. So the last thing you want to do is make any final adjustments, adjust your materials, adjust your lighting, adjust your camera angle. Sometimes a more um, Dutch angle looks pretty cool for your objects if you do like, you know, one of these and kind of make it rotated. Sometimes those look pretty cool. Really all up to you though.
but you don't want to go too harsh with it. Sometimes it doesn't fit either. Sometimes just having a straight shot is um is better. So you know, play with it. Play with the camera and see what you like. There's not really a right or wrong. It's just what you like and what you don't like. So I think this is a good angle here. Really, sometimes just a bit of camera rotation makes all the difference uh, aesthetically talking. So what we're going to do is get this thing ready for rendering. I have a separate video on rendering settings. I'll link it in the description. And um, yeah, you can watch that or I'll just quickly show you why not. So I render with a graphics card. You don't need really any more than 200 samples simply because we're going to be using the AI denoiser. Light paths, you can just copy the settings here. And performance really depends on your system. I'm running with a graphics card, so I'm just using 1024 by 1024. Uh, last setting, go to the layers panel, turn on the denoising data option. And then all you have to do is go up here to the compositor and set up this exact node setup right here. What this will actually do is clean up any noise you get as a result of your final render. Now in this case, you don't really need the glare node simply because we're not using any sort of emissive lighting. If you were, then you would actually get a nice bloom effect if you use this node. So basically what you do is you go up here to click on use nodes. You're going to, um, I'll remove this one. You're going to press shift A, go to filter, denoise, and then literally connect up the denoise node like you see here. That's all you have to do. And then you're basically ready to render. And for rendering, I just render at 2560 by 1440, same aspect ratio as 1080p, just a bit higher. You could get away with 1920 by 1080 though, that's fine. Um, I use a 16-bit TIFF for best quality, and um, yeah, that's all you have to do. So just go ahead and press the F12 button on your keyboard, or go up here to render, and you're ready to go. So here's the final render, and here's the result after doing a bit of post-processing in Photoshop. Really easy to get this effect, just a few clicks in the camera raw filter and you're good to go. So thanks for watching, I hope this video provided some insight into the technicalities and fundamentals of hard surface modeling. And also, if you want more exclusive monthly tutorials like this, consider signing up for our Patreon. Every single month we do two complete tutorials, one with add-ons and one in the vanilla workflow. And we have tons of other perks on there as well you can check out. So once again, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.